Hello, my name is Ashley Lister and I'm here talking about my Saboteur award-winning novella, Seagulls from Hell. This is from the prologue. The seagull has landed. The sign said, Welcome to Blackpool. With a lowering thundercloud on the horizon and the first flecks of rain coming down, the view did not look particularly welcoming. The famous tower was a faraway blimp on the horizon. The curves of a gigantic roller coaster loomed like the curls of loose threads near the hem of a threadbare grey sky. The whole scene looked even less welcoming when a hefty spatter of seagull shit slapped across the windscreen. The guano appeared like a mixture of white emulsion with a green and yellow kernel at its heart. Overhead, a seagull screamed. Filthy fucking creatures, Chris grumbled. He hit the wiper and the screen wash. For a moment, the entire screen was whitened by diluted bird shit. Then the car's single blade began to clear the mess and he was looking at the approaching town of Blackpool and telling himself this weekend wouldn't be as bad as he feared. Isn't it supposed to be lucky? Pamela asked. Chris said nothing. The car was the Pagani Huayri Roadster, based on the classic stylings of the Pagani Zonda R. It was the sort of glossy low-riding sports car that made heads turn when he drove past. The Nero Black Star paintwork was something he polished every week until the vehicle was back to its usual oily luster. A spattering of corrosive seagull crap on the bonnet was going to mean he needed to teacut the damn thing over the next weekend, or maybe shell out for a professional external valet. If that was needed, he'd be looking at a bill in excess of 200 quid just to remove the stain from a spatter of bird shit. In short, Chris didn't feel particularly lucky. Bloody gulls, he muttered. But isn't it supposed to be lucky, Pam pressed. He tightened his facial muscles, hoping it looked like he was giving the dizzy bitch a grin whilst he nodded. A weekend with Pam promised several good things. For a start, because she'd selected Blackpool, he knew she was cheap. Also, she banged like a shithouse door in a thunderstorm. And, probably most important for his needs, she was very, very attractive. Her hair, breasts, legs and face all seemed pleasingly proportioned, youthful and made her strikingly similar to the stars of his favourite clips on Pornhub. If only he'd been able to mute her volume in the same way he could mute a Pornhub clip when the woman had one of those fake screeching orgasms, Pam would have been the ideal partner. Maddeningly, Pam seemed to take exception to his attempts to cover her lips whilst they were having sex. And, after he'd tried it once, she was adamant he couldn't stuff her knickers in her mouth ever again. Another spatter of seagull shit was thrown across the windscreen. It was a torrential downpour of seagull shit, he thought miserably. Bastard things, he snapped. As they'd been driving, Chris had noticed the screech of the seagulls increased the closer they got to Blackpool. At first it had been a far away sound, slightly jarring and a little discordant, but nothing more than a reminder that they were nearing the coast. A few miles closer and he realised he wasn't hearing the gentle seagulls that could be heard cooing over the intro of the Sleepy Lagoon when it was played on desert island discs. These were gulls that were searching for food or territory or sex. After a while he wondered if he was really hearing gulls or if he was approaching some nightmare location where babies and infants were being massacred, mutilated and flayed alive. The cries of the gulls were loud, almost human and chilling with their shrill and piercing wail. He didn't want to think it sounded like peel babies being dipped in vinegar, but once that image was fixed in his thoughts, it refused to go. He hit the screen wash and the roadster's single wiper made short work of the pot shot of seagull cream that had covered the windscreen. Chris tried not to notice that the edges of the screen were now daubed with white lines as reminders of what had stained the vehicle. What do you want to do first once we've checked in? 
Pamela asked. Chris waggled a suggestive eyebrow. Do you really need to ask what I want to do? Pam groaned good-naturedly and punched him lightly on the arm. We didn't just come here to do that, did we? she admonished. He shrugged, genuinely puzzled by her comment. We're staying at the Cleveland's Hotel just outside Blackpool, he reminded her. Aside from watching the traffic lights change, I don't think there's much else to do. Pam giggled and shook her head. The conversation continued as they parked in front of their hotel and walked hurriedly to the reception desk, trying to avoid the fattening droplets of rain that were falling from the darkening skies. Whilst Chris summoned the concierge by slamming repeatedly on the bell, Pam said, I think I'd like to go for a run before we have our meal this evening. A run? Chris echoed. He said the words with the same lack of comprehension he would have used if she'd said she wanted to go for a chocolate bison or an electric handshake. The option of going for a run simply made no sense and he stared at her curiously as his head shook slowly from side to side. Pam gestured at her clothes, a bright orange and black designer wear exercise outfit from the brand Axis. I'm already in my running gear, she explained. It would be silly not to take advantage of the opportunity. But it's about to piss it down, Chris objected. A little rain never hurt anyone, she laughed easily. Chris stopped himself from mentioning the people who had recently died in floods in Europe, or asking what happened to the people who lived next door to Noah. Instead, he said, I'm going to get myself a massive bourbon and chillax whilst you're out running in the rain. The concierge approached. He was a broad-faced man with a patient smile and a massive stomach. His once white shirt sleeves were rolled up to reveal brawny forearms and a fading tattoo that had probably been an anchor. He had been grinning genially as he stepped behind the reception desk, but he frowned on hearing Chris's words. Glancing from Chris to Pam, he said, Was one of you thinking of going out running? Are you sure that's wise? This is what I was saying. Chris agreed. It's about to chuck it down, isn't it? The concierge nodded uncomfortably. Yes, sir, he agreed. That's just the point I was going to make. Chris wasn't sure he believed this. He got the impression that there was something else on the concierge's mind, but he couldn't think of a way to press his point without sounding either paranoid or mental. I'm just going to do 5k along the seafront, Pam said firmly. Chris could tell from the determination in her voice that she was now intent on going for her run, regardless of how bad the weather got or how much common sense was thrust on her. He had met plenty of women with the defiant attitude of doing exactly the opposite of what better minds advised. He supposed one of the reasons he had ended up in bed with so many of such types of stubborn-minded women was simply because their more perceptive female friends had warned them against him and those stubborn-minded women had dated Chris as a show of defiance. In some circles, he suspected he was likely a cautionary tale. The thought made him grin, as though, in acquiring infamy, he'd achieved something. It'll be dark by the time you set off, the concierge told her. I've got good night vision, Pam returned, and I'd strongly advise against running along the seafront after dark, the concierge said. He lowered his tone to a grave whisper as he added, There have been incidents. He said the final word with the sort of stress people used for the most delicate of euphemisms. This was the same way someone talked about an elderly racist relative as having old-fashioned opinions, or a closeted celebrity having a special male friend. What sort of incidents? Pam asked. The concierge shook his head called for a porter and said, I don't want to sour the start of your stay with us by sharing scary stories. Please, just trust me when I say running along the seafront after dark is not advised. OK, Pam said simply. Thanks for the warning. And Chris could hear in her tone that she was going to ignore the advice and run along the seafront anyway. Secretly, he hoped that one of her sensible girlfriends had warned Pam not to do anal with him. Forty minutes later, Chris was sitting in his room and the first stirrings of panic began to flutter in his breast. He was on his third JD and Coke, P 
peering out of the hotel window to the storm-lashed seafront and wondering what the hell had happened to Pam. She had gone out for her run, promising him that she would do 5k at the most, but that was 40 minutes ago. Her typical 5k time, when she was feeling competitive, came in well under 20 minutes. He had never known her take longer than 30 minutes to do such a distance. And here it was, 40 full minutes since she'd set off, and he felt a growing disquiet that he wasn't going to see her again. Worse. It was impossible to think clearly with the murdered baby screech he was hearing from the gulls outside the hotel. The cries were horrific. They were the agonised wails of the tortured souls hurled into hell's fiery pits. They were the brutalised screams of torment and agony he would have expected to hear if someone had thrown a rabid werewolf into a convent. It was the sound that would come if a hook-handed rapist broke into a girl's dormitory. The birds did not chirrup or tweet or trill or quack or do anything that had a remotely musical sound. The bloody gulls squawked as though they had human voice boxes and were suffering at the hands of a sadistic murderer. Where the fuck are you, Pam? Chris grumbled. He drained his JD and Coke, poured himself another one. If she didn't get back soon, he figured he would be too pissed to take advantage of her lax morals and pawn her good looks. But a growing sense of unease wouldn't let him steer clear of the drink. He needed the alcohol so he didn't have to think about what might have happened to her. She'd gone for a run on the seafront and according to the concierge, the seafront was where there had been incidents. After 60 minutes, he tried ringing her mobile. She always took a Samsung with her when she went running. The GPS tracked her location and, because she wore earbuds with it, he figured she could answer a call without interrupting her run. The connection went straight through to voicemail. It was 90 minutes after she'd left to run when he called down to the reception desk and asked if Pam had left a message for him. I'm sorry, sir, the concierge said coolly. We've had no message and your lady friend was warned not to. Chris hung up, unwilling to hear the Blackpool version of I told you so from the concierge. He tried to think what might have happened to Pam, but it was difficult to concentrate because of a mixture of JD driving rain against his hotel window and screeching seagulls. A decent guy, he supposed, would possibly go out into the streets and look for her, but that would have meant leaving behind his bourbon and the warmth of this room and getting piss wet through for a dumb bitch too stupid not to go running in the rain in the dark. Coming to a quick decision, he drained his fifth bourbon, staggered to the doorway and then took a lift downstairs to the hotel restaurant. Are you dining alone? the waitress asked. Unless you'd care to join me, Chris said. The words were slightly slurred, but he could still tell that she was impressed. I'm the guest with the Pagani, he added, giving her a conspiratorial wink. He held up his key fob, which was shaped like a shiny Pagani roadster. The waitress ignored the key fob and smiled sympathetically. That Pagani must be very uncomfortable, she told him. Would you like me to get a doughnut so your chair's a little more comfortable? He puzzled his way through her words before realising she'd made a mistake. No, he said hurriedly. The Pagani roadster is a sports car, not another name for hemorrhoids. He was still trying to assure her of this point when she left him alone at his table, studying the menu and wondering how he had ended up wasting his weekend on his own in Blackpool with a date that had gone AWOL. And not just any date. She'd been a Pornhub lookalike with a reputation that said she was easier than a tabloid crossword. She'd been a dead cert and he'd been looking forward to a weekend of alcohol and sex. But now, unless he could convince the waitress that he didn't have hemorrhoids, Chris could see he was just going to spend the night wanking himself to sleep whilst he cried about his loneliness. It wasn't fair, he thought bitterly. He owned a Pagani roadster. Excuse me, sir. It was the concierge who had spoken. He appeared at Chris's side like the shopkeeper in the old Mr Ben cartoons. The concierge was holding a padded cushion that looked like a doughnut. 
Your waitress said you might be able to make use of this. No, Chris said firmly. I think we were talking at cross purposes. The concierge glanced at the empty seat facing Chris and then said, Your companion hasn't yet returned from her short run. No, Chris said again. This time he could feel anger tighten the word in his throat. Perhaps I could help with that, the concierge said brightly. I think I might know where you could find her. Would you like to follow me through the kitchens? It wasn't what Chris was expecting to hear, but he figured there must be a reason for the concierge to make such an invitation. He stood up, didn't bother objecting when the concierge placed the padded doughnut on his chair, and followed obediently as the man led him to a doorway marked staff only. The noise in the kitchens was not what Chris had been expecting. Aside from the hiss and sizzle of cooking food, the flurry of warm baking flavours and the chatter and banter of chefs, he could hear the nearby screech of gulls as they tried to outdo each other with their menacing cries. This was the sound a baby would make if someone stuck a knife in its eye. This was the sound a toddler would make if someone cut it with a rusty razor. This was the sound a young girl would make if she was beaten, battered and sexually brutalised. Those birds are fucking loud, Chris told the concierge. The kitchen doors are open, the concierge explained. He raised his voice to make himself heard over the noise. And the gulls have a habit of congregating around local kitchens. They're seldom quiet when they're feeding. He continued walking through the kitchen, heading towards the open doorway. A hiss of rain was audible beneath the screech of the cacophonic birdsong. Chris could hear the dry flap and flutter of wings, the sounds punctuating the screams and squeals of each cry from a gull. Just through there, sir, the concierge said, quietly gesturing for Chris to step outside. Puzzled, Chris did as the concierge suggested. What am I doing out here? Chris asked. You'll find your companion out there, the concierge explained. And then he closed the door. Chris found himself alone in the yard behind the kitchen, listening to the screech and scream of a dozen fat gulls. Light from a nearby street lamp illuminated the grey and white plumage of the birds, as well as the falling silver needles of rain. He could see oily black bin bags on the floor, and two aggressive birds were fighting over them. But that wasn't the sight that captured his attention. He could see the remains of Pam's body sprawled beside one of the bins. It was her orange and black Axis running gear he recognised first. A seagull was pecking at the remnants of her face. Its beak and head were sticky with blood. A gristle-like piece of flesh hung from the side of its mouth. Whilst it continued to peck at its meal, it considered Chris with a blank-eyed expression of malice that seemed to say, You're next. Several of the gulls were working on Pam's body. She had a missing arm and there was a hole in her throat. The squawking birds occasionally snapped at each other for a choice of piece of meat, but for the majority of the time they seemed happy to screech like banshees and then continued to feed from their victim. Chris turned to the closed kitchen door. There was no handle. He hammered his fist against the door and called, Let me in. You have to let me in. There's a dead woman out here and she's been killed and eaten by these bloody gulls. From behind the door, he heard a laconic chuckle. Speaking carefully, the concierge said, We know what's out there. Your companion was one of the two offerings we've made to the gulls this evening. Two offerings? Chris asked doubtfully. What's the other one? Something flapped against the side of his head. He flipped out a hand to push it away and half turned. A beak pushed at his eye and plucked it from its socket. The pain was so enormous he fell to his knees with a squeal that sounded as though it had come from the birds. And then they were on him, fluttering, flapping, pecking and snapping. And in that moment, Chris understood that he was the other offering. So there we have it. Those were the opening pages from 
Seagulls from Hell. My inspiration for this. There's three areas of inspiration, really. Um, the first one being Blackpool Horror Society. I'm a member of Blackpool Horror Society, and one of the things that we were doing um, one week was trying to write a horror story that had some sort of animal attack in it. And because I live in Blackpool, I chose seagulls. There's also the Ash and Cole podcast. Uh, this is one that me and my friend Colin Davis, we regularly meet up online and we talk about short stories. We've expanded it since then to talk about um, horror films as well. But one of the earliest short stories we looked at was Robert E. Howard's Pigeons from Hell. Pigeons from Hell is a horror short story that was written by the American writer Robert E. Howard. It was written in late 1934, published posthumously by Weird Tales in 1938. And the title comes from an image in Howard's grandmother's ghost stories, um, that of a deserted plantation mansion haunted by pigeons. In this story, two New Englanders, John Branner and his friend Griswell, travel in the south and spend the night in a deserted plantation manor. Griswell awakens from a dream of a yellow-faced creature looking at him. He sees Branner walk up the stairs in a trance. He is horrified when Branner returns as an animated corpse gripping the bloody axe that had split his skull. Griswell flees into the woods as you would. In his flight, Griswell meets the county's sheriff, Buckner, who investigates the house and finds Branner motionless on the floor. Griswell is implicated in his friend's murder, but the sheriff gives him the benefit of the doubt and tries to clear him. Buckner gives some credence to Griswell's bizarre tale due to the manor's ominous reputation because it was the Bassonville's, sorry, it was the Blassonville's residence, a family from the West Indies who were known for their cruelty. After the American Civil War, the Blassonville's fell into poverty with all their menfolk dead and only four sisters remaining. Um, shortly, they were to be joined by their Aunt Celia from the West Indies and her mulatto maid, Joan. Celia mistreated Joan and, when the latter disappeared, it was thought she had run away. Soon after, Celia vanished as well, and it was thought that she had returned to the West Indies. Over the next months, three of the Blassenville sisters also vanished one by one. One night in 1890, the last of the Blassenvilles, Elizabeth, fled the house, claiming she had found her sister's corpses in a secret room and that she had been attacked by the shape of a woman with a yellow face. She left for California and never returned. The manor has lain deserted since, and the local black folk shun it. The eponymous pigeons sometimes flock about the decaying manor, and legend has it that they are the Blassenville's souls. So the following evening, Buckner and Griswell visit the hut of an ancient voodoo man, Jacob, seeking information about the house and the Blassenville's. Jacob tells of the extinct family and of Celia Blassenville, who mistreated her mulatto maid, Joan. He claims to be a maker of Zvembis, but he insists he cannot talk about them to a white man without Dambalar sending a snake with a white crescent moon on its head to kill him. Bertie drifts into senility and rambles about voodoo, the god Dambalar, and about zombies and their female counterparts, Zvembis, who live only to kill and have no sense of time, possess hypnotic powers, and who can live indefinitely unless wounded by steel or lead. Finally, he tells how she participated in voodoo rites and that the other came to Jacob for the black brew that makes a woman a Zavembi. 
Reaching for firewood, Jacob is bitten by a venomous snake, meeting the fate he feared. Buckner and Griswell conclude that Joan transformed herself into a Zvembi to exact vengeance on Celia Blassenville and her nieces. They resolve to spend the night in Blassenville Manor uh, to learn the truth. There they find Elizabeth Blassenville's diary, which tells of her fears that something is in the house with her, has killed her sisters and will kill her. That night, while laying awake in the darkness, Griswell hears the same whistling as the previous night, which Elizabeth's diary had also mentioned. Thinking he is fleeing the house, he finds himself climbing the manor stairs against his will. He is confronted by a female apparition with a yellow face and a knife. Griswell is powerless to resist, but Bruckner, who has followed him up the stairs, shoots the creature which flees, mortally wounded. They track its dying noises to the secret room where they find the hanging bodies of the three missing Blassenville sisters as well as the corpse of the Zvembi, which is still dressed in a ball gown. Bruckner recognises the face of the Zvembi from a portrait he has seen. It is Celia Blassenville. The maid, Joan, in revenge, gave the black brew she got from Jacob to her mistress and fled. Celia Blassenville transformed into a Zvembi, killed three of her nieces and had been living in the abandoned manor, killing anyone who entered it at night. Ruckner says that the case can be closed by saying that a mad woman had killed Griswell's friend, John Branner, since nobody will believe the truth. I suppose it was partly because I'd been reading about pigeons from hell that I got the idea for seagulls from hell as well. Which meant I had to do some research. And my research um, started off with the following questions. What is a seagull? Which seagulls live in Blackpool? What does the RSPCA say about seagulls? And do seagulls have teeth? So the first thing I found out is that seagulls don't exist. Although the term seagull is commonly used, there isn't technically any such thing as a seagull. The RSPB says that seagull is an informal way of referring to any of the species that belong to the family Luridae, the gulls. Six most common species of gulls found in the UK are herring gulls, black-headed gulls, Lesser black backed gulls, great black backed gulls, common gulls, and kittiwakes. And other than kittiwakes, all of the above species can be found in and around built up areas. The image that we've got there is of a herring gull with the first year's plumage. So there are different species of gulls and they exhibit different behaviours in terms of where they nest and where they forage. Some gulls are natural scavengers and can be drawn inland by availability of food in towns or at landfill sites. Traditionally gulls nest on sea cliffs, dunes, islands and other inaccessible locations. But some gulls have successfully adopted roofs for nesting. Gulls may behave aggressively during the nesting season in order to protect their eggs or chicks. And because this story is set in Blackpool, we're looking at Laris argentatus, or the herring gull. Herring gulls are large, noisy gulls found throughout the year around our coasts and inland, around rubbish tips, fields, large reservoirs and lakes, especially during winter. The adults have light grey backs, white underparts and black wingtips. Their legs are pink with webbed feet and they have heavy, slightly hooked bills marked with a red spot. And the young birds are mottled brown in colour. What 
of the eat. Well, actually, they're omnivorous. Um, they'll eat carrion, they will eat offal, seeds, fruits. They will eat young birds, eggs, small mammals, insects, and fish. And in Seagulls from Hell, they will also eat holidaymakers. On average, the lifespan of a seagull in the wild is between 10 to 20 years. Nevertheless, the type of seagull can make a significant difference to these figures. Herring gulls, for example, can live for up to 30 years or more, with a maximum of 49 years being recorded for this species. And these are the measurements. So, in length, from the tip of their tail to the end of their beak, they can measure between 54 and 60 centimetres. They have a wingspan of somewhere between 130 and 150 centimetres and weight between 690 grams and 1440 grams. It would definitely be worth pausing this video just to get a tape measure and see how long 150 centimetres is because it's quite an impressive wingspan. According to the RSPCA, herring gulls in particular need to leave the nest and spend time on the ground in order to finish growing their flight feathers. Most people who call the RSPCA are simply concerned about a bird's welfare and are more than happy to keep a watchful eye on them and ensure they have a bowl of water to drink from. Some callers though view the gulls as vermin. Not least because the parent birds can be aggressive towards humans when they're protecting their young. This doesn't last for long and callers are advised to use an umbrella for protection or wear a hat or a cap. There is evidence to suggest that gulls are attracted to the colour red and that they may pick on people wearing red clothing. Adult gulls have a large red spot on their otherwise yellow lower beak, which is used for social signalling to other gulls, and it's how young birds feed. They peck at the red spot to stimulate the parent bird to regurgitate food. Which brings us to the question, do seagulls have teeth? Rather than teeth, they have what's called tamaya. Herring gulls are a fish-eating species. They have sawtooth serrations along their tamaya. That's the ridges that you can see coming from the beak going into the mouth. So they've got sawtooth serrations along their tamaya, which help them to keep hold of their slippery, wriggling prey. Whilst I was doing my research, some other questions arose. Well, the popular questions as well, that's the reason why I've got uh, most of these down here. Um, do seagulls explode if you give them Alka-Seltzer? What happens if you give a seagull laxatives? Do seagulls explode if you give them paracetamol? Why don't we eat seagulls? What do seagulls taste like? And why don't you ever see baby seagulls? So, do seagulls explode if you give them Alka-Seltzer? No. What happens if you give a seagull laxatives? Um, they poop. The actual answer to this one, uh, when I was looking online, said they become horrifying death monsters capable of faeces attack. Do seagulls explode if you give them paracetamol? And still the answer is no. Again, as with the Alsa seltzer question, this is based on the erroneous notion that seagulls can't pass gas, and a product that incites the excessive production of intestinal gas would cause swelling to the point of bursting. Given that seagulls can regurgitate food to feed their young, this suggests that the seagull's gullet is capable of two-way traffic and will allow gas to pass. It was thought to be more dangerous to give seagulls, or any bird, uncooked rice, 
as there was a worry that this could cause swelling in the stomach and produce the exploding seagulls that everybody seems to want to see. This notion was tested, don't ask, but it seemed that seagulls aren't stupid enough to eat so much food that their stomachs explode. However, the worry that it could be problematic has seen many weddings stop the traditional throwing of rice and replace it with the throwing of birdseed. Why don't we eat seagulls? There's several reasons, but these are the main ones. Um, firstly, they're a protected species. Secondly, there isn't much meat on them. And thirdly, and perhaps most important, apparently they don't taste pleasant. Again, according to my research, the flesh of an animal tends to be flavoured by what it's been eating. This is why we idolise flavours like corn-fed chicken or Kobe beef. If this is true, if the flesh of an animal is flavoured by what it's been eating, then a Blackpool seagull would likely taste of dodgy chips, roadkill and Jägermeister vomit. And the final question there was, why don't you ever see baby seagulls? Partly this is because the parents are very protective. Partly it's because nests are typically on roofs or cliff tops, away from humans and other predators. But the truth is, sometimes we do see them. This is a baby seagull at one week old. This is that same baby seagull at one week old, with his tiny little wings sticking out. And this is him at five weeks old. So, we do occasionally see baby seagulls. Within Seagulls from Hell, we encounter hobo deathmatches. So the origin of the term hobo cannot really be traced. A few suggestions have been put forward. Some say it comes from hoboy, because many migrant workers travelled with a hoe or other farming tools. Others claim it came from soldiers returning from the Civil War who were homeward bound. Some suggest it's from the congenial greeting, hello boy, that changed to low boy and low bow, and finally hobo. Others think it came from the word hoosier, meaning a rustic individual, a frontiersman. And there are even those who say it comes from the Latin homo bonus, meaning good man, or the French, or beau, um, the highest of the handsome. But few, if any of these explanations, seem adequate. However the term hobo originated, it came into common usage by the end of the 19th century. So this is your dictionary definition of the word hobo. Um, as we can see, North American, a homeless person, a tramp or vagrant. I used the word hobo in my novella for the sake of clarity, even though this is a very grey area of usage. The British English pejorative tramp is potentially confusing. As you can see here, we've got the dictionary definition of tramp, which means as a verb to walk heavily or noisily. As a noun, it can be a person who travels from place to place on foot in search of work or as a vagrant or as a beggar. It can mean the sound of heavy steps. But tramp also has other meanings. According to the Urban Dictionary, as we see here, um, tramp can be a grey dog in a Disney film with a shaggy beard. Um, his girlfriend is called Lady. It can be a dog that shares his spaghetti bolognese with a lady around the back of Luigi's Italian restaurant. Or a tramp can be your mum. The example here is your mum is a tramp because she had sex with a shaggy bearded waiter outside Luigi's Italian restaurant. Again, for part of my research, I was looking into the situation of homeless people in Blackpool. According to the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, the JSNA, um, they say the number of rough sleepers in Blackpool tends to range between 10 and 15 individuals, usually rising in summer. The 
not 100% convinced that this is accurate. I'm not trying to dispute what the JSNA are saying, but uh, from my own experience driving through the town, I'm sure I've seen on a daily basis more than 10 to 15 individuals who look homeless. And as we'll see as the story progresses, Seagulls from Hell brings in a comparison between hobos and seagulls. And there are really quite a lot of reasons why we could compare these two. They've got an urban presence. Homeless individuals and seagulls are frequently seen in urban areas. Homeless populations may seek shelter in cities, while seagulls are often found near coastal cities and even further inland. There's adaptability. Both your homeless individuals and your seagulls have shown the ability to adapt to various environments and conditions. Homeless people often have to navigate changing circumstances and locations, while seagulls can thrive in different coastal and urban settings. There's also migratory behaviour. Seagulls are known for their migratory patterns, moving between breeding and feeding grounds. Homeless individuals may also be mobile, travelling from one location to another in search of opportunities or support. And saddening, saddeningly, we also have scavenging. Homeless individuals, like seagulls, may sometimes engage in scavenging for food and resources to survive. And both groups can be very resourceful in finding sustenance. All of which leads me to the first chapter from Seagulls from Hell. This is chapter one and it's called The Punch and Jody Show. The Blackpool illuminations were bright enough to darken the night sky to inky impenetrability. Because of the light pollution, there was no visible moon above and there wouldn't be stars again until the end of the summer season. Deacon and Cheryl, lurking behind the Bispen tableau at the northernmost end of the promenade, were swathed in discreet shadows, only yards away from the chitter-chatter of excited conversations coming from those standing on the lit side of the promenade. It was a Wednesday night with a chilly wind blowing in from the sea and virtually howling when it reached the cliff tops and Deacon and Cheryl had just finished a brisk but effective outdoor fuck. Isn't this romantic? Cheryl asked, squeezing his hand after pulling her knickers back up. She was tall and blonde and, save for a slight tummy, she had a relatively athletic body on her. Deacon had thought she might be out of his league when he first seen her but she'd accepted his invitation for a walk on the promenade and, when he'd made the lewd suggestion that they could do more behind the tableaus, she had proved to be more than amenable. He supposed it was that easiness she had displayed that was now making him wonder if he was really attracted to her. Don't you think it's romantic? Cheryl asked again. Deacon shrugged. He wouldn't have called it romantic. He got a knee trembler from a slapper at the top of the cliffs. The wind was so bad it felt like it had blown enough sand up his arsehole so he'd be shitting dunes for the next month. But he knew better than to voice such opinions in response to a question about the romance of the evening. Experience had taught him that even slappers with the lax morals of Cheryl had feelings. Do you want to come and do something fun? he asked suddenly. More fun than what we just did? Cheryl sounded doubtful. Deacon laughed and wondered if he was supposed to make some comment about how great the sex had been. It hadn't been anything remarkable. A shag on the prom was no more extraordinary than finding a Blackpool shop selling fish and chips or Blackpool rock or cheap dildos. Given Cheryl's unenthusiastic performance, sloppy kisses flavoured with Lambrini and a fanny that had clearly seen more cock than Colonel Sanders, Deacon was hard pushed to think of it as fun rather than an expected chore to prove his masculinity. Taking her hand, pulling her with him as they descended into the darkness along one of the pathways leading down the cliff to the sea defences above the seashore, Deacon said, 
I promise you, this is going to be the most exciting thing you've ever done in Blackpool. Ooh, she giggled. Where are you taking me? He called the words over his shoulder as they ran down a slope that submerged them in shadows. The cliffs were crisscrossed with sloping paths that led up and down from the cliff tops to the sea defences above the beach. Descending the path in the darkness, whilst hurrying at speed, was a breathtaking experience. Deacon had often thought it was like running into the unknown, hurtling into oblivion. Even though he could see a wink of torchlight on the beach below, it still felt as though he was throwing himself down into the blackness of an unseen and unforgiving hell. You're not a local, are you? he called to her. No. So you don't know about the problems that Blackpool has? Problems? Blackpool has problems with poverty, he began. Poverty? She resisted him for a moment and said, You're not some sort of social worker, are you? He laughed, amused by the thought. The town has problems with poverty, he explained. This means we have a large homeless population and we have lots of chemical dependency. Do you mean drugs? Yes, I mean drugs. Have you never seen any of the YouTube videos where someone feeds K2 to a local spice head? There was a moment's pause before she said, Yeah, I've seen a couple of those. She was silent for another beat before saying, They're hilarious. He chuckled and said, Yeah, I filmed a couple of those myself. Legend, she laughed happily. When he began to run again, she followed him with more enthusiasm. Is that where we're going now? she asked eagerly. Are we going to feed a spice head? No, we've got something better than that to do. We're going to go and see the Punch and Jody show. He could sense that she was frowning, not sure if she'd heard him correctly, and trying to make sense of his words as he spat them back at her. She was still running after him her Primark heels clipping on the stone steps as they hurried from the top of the cliffs to the brutalist concrete walkway of the sea defences that edged the seashore. The darkness here was like swimming in black paint. Occasional glimpses of torchlight on the beach assured Deacon he was going in the right direction, but his vision remained sufficiently clouded by the night's shadows for him to doubt his senses, even when they were climbing down the stone stairs that led to the sandy shore. He was still unsure that he was going to find the Punch and Jody show. But he didn't let Cheryl see his reservations. The air was acidic with the fishy stench of brine. He could feel the gritty texture of sand between the soles of his trainers and the long stone steps. Deacon cautioned himself to slow down for fear of stumbling in the dark. A cold wind slid smoothly from the Irish Sea, its chilly fingers caressing Deacon's face and neck and making him shiver. Is somebody burning something down there? Cheryl asked. Are those candles I can see? He laughed and shook his head. Reaching back for her, taking her hand and guiding her onto the beach, he said, Those aren't candles. They're tiki torches. He allowed her eyes to adjust to the view, figuring it would take a moment to get used to the sight of a circle of eight torches burning on the damp sand. What's going on? Cheryl asked doubtfully. She had paused at the bottom of the steps and no longer seemed eager to rush with him into the darkness of this adventure. He wondered if she had seen some of the dark figures moving near the torches, or if she was just picking up the irresistible idea that something was wrong down here. Very wrong. Is there really a Punch and Judy show down here? Punch and Jody, he corrected. He pulled gently on her hand and, with obvious reluctance, she stumbled along after him toward the torchlight. Punch and Jody is the local name for this piece of seaside entertainment, Deacon explained. I think, when I've seen it happening elsewhere in the country, they simply call it hobo fighting. She gasped as her eyes adjusted slowly to the dim light and Deacon could understand her reaction. In the centre of the circle of tiki torches stood two tramps, both shirtless with their hands bandaged. Even in this dim light it was obvious that they were both homeless. They wore beards that looked to be competing for being straggliest and most unkempt. The orange and yellow torchlight fluttering across their bodies showed flesh 
that was either bruised by dirt, injury or poor life choices. The pants they wore, saggy arsed sweatpants that were overstretched at the knees, were ill-fitting and tied with string at the waist. But it was also clear that both participants had formidable builds. Admittedly, they were more dad bod than ripped or jacked, but each had a decent set of biceps and pecs and both looked more than capable of handling a physical confrontation. They're genuine hobos, Cheryl gasped. Hence the reason they call this hobo fighting, Deacon agreed. A crowd of two or three dozen people stood around them, some of them chattering happily whilst others looked to be involved in making bets. The light wasn't great around those making bets, but it was bright enough for Deacon to see substantial wads of money changing hands. He checked his wallet and wondered if it was worth putting a ton on Jody's main player. Cheryl clutched tight at his arm and whispered in his ear, Is this really hobo fighting? Is that what we're going to watch? Deacon stepped closer to the circle and, seeing a figure he recognised, handed over two £50 notes. Two to watch the match, he explained. Will you be having a bet on tonight's game, Deacon? Cheryl arched her eyebrows, as though she was surprised to hear it was a woman's voice. The figure was wrapped in shapeless clothes, with a black baseball cap concealing her eyes and a hoodie pulled over her baseball cap. Deacon, who had met Jody in places other than at the hobo fights, remembered the woman constantly wore black, from her jet black trainers and jeans through to her jet black sweatshirt and hair. The two fifties Jody held had disappeared and the woman was shifting rhythmically from side to side as she waited for Deacon's answer to her question. Who's your fighter? Deacon asked. Raging Bill, Jody said coolly. She nodded toward the illuminated ring and Cheryl saw two tramps standing there. Bill's the one with the X on his tit. Cheryl peered into the darkness and saw that the sandy-haired tramp with the straggly beard had a letter X branded over his left breast. The skin was puckered into a raised bump that looked painful and slightly infected. The other competitor, bald and less imposing, had a freshly branded letter O in the same place. Cheryl figured this was how the fighters were going to be identified for those unfamiliar with their distinguishing features. Raging Bill, Deacon marvelled. Is this his third fight or his fourth? Eighth, Jody said. He's been undefeated for the past month. Impressive, Deacon muttered. And his opponent? Jody shrugged. A couple of Preston lads have brought him down as a contender. Lowering her voice, she said, he doesn't stand a chance. He's got the build, but there's no fight in him. They're pitching him here under the nickname Hulk Hobo. And that's the best thing about him. Deacon laughed. He produced his wallet and took out a sheaf of banknotes. A grand on raging bill to win, he said, pushing the money into Jody's hand. He made sure that Cheryl could see he was gambling with a substantial amount of cash. He knew he no longer needed to impress the woman, but force of habit made him try to flash the cash so she could see he was a man of means. Jody nodded agreement to Deacon's bet and made the money disappear into one of her many black pockets. She glanced beyond him and Deacon understood that she was checking to see if anyone else was going to be coming to watch the match. When she nodded her head, making an indistinct gesture to someone neither Cheryl nor Deacon could see, an expectant silence fell over those gathered and they knew the match was about to start. The only noises came from the hiss of the nearby sea as it headed lazily toward them and the faraway roar of traffic from beyond the cliff tops. Jody stepped into the illuminated circle and raised a hand. Ladies and gentlemen, she called. She turned 360 degrees so that none of the audience felt excluded. Thank you for coming to tonight's game. I trust you've all paid your admission fees and made suitable bets. She paused for a moment in case a member of the audience wanted to offer her more money or make an additional wager. No one spoke, but Cheryl was practically squirming next to Deacon and he could understand why. 
The tension in the air was growing richer and more electric as the event got closer to beginning. Deacon could feel his own heartbeat hammering with increased excitement as he realised he was going to be watching an illicit fight and he knew it would be a death match. Is this like bare knuckle fighting? Cheryl asked, whispering the words on hot breath against the cold shell of his ear. Not exactly, Deacon said, pointing to the fighters. Both men had their hands clumsily bandaged until it looked like they were wearing balloons on the ends of their wrists. The white bandages were crisscrossed by grey lines that had a dull metallic glint in the glare of the ticky torch light. Tonight's competitors are local boy Raging Bill, undefeated winner of the last eight matches. Jody paused for a moment, allowing a handful of audience members to applaud and shout encouragement. And he'll be fighting against our esteemed visitor from Preston, Mr Hulk Hobo. The cheers for Hulk Hobo were louder, but, like everyone else at the match, Hulk Hobo clearly knew the smart money was against him. No one got to be undefeated champion over eight matches without having some serious fighting skills. Hulk Hobo eyed his competitor warily, his sharp eyes looking for some potential weakness he could exploit. Please remember, Jody told her audience, these two gentlemen of the road are going to fight each other to the death. Hulk Hobo, the tramp marked by the letter O in his chest, widened his eyes in surprise and shook his head. I'm not fighting no one to the death. He raised one bandaged hand and pointed it at Raging Bill. I'll beat the fucker unconscious, but I'm not killing him. Jody turned to the two Preston lads who had brought Hulk Hobo to the match. Did you not tell your boy about the rules? They wore matching beanie caps and lurked in the shadows sharing a spliff. The taller one was wearing a dark tracksuit, the shorter one was wearing jeans and a tired denim jacket. We didn't want to make our boy nervous, the one in the tracksuit called. We thought he'd enjoy the surprise, the other added. They both erupted into the spluttering giggles of a pair of stoners. Hulk Hobo's features dissolved into an expression of pained misery. Jody turned to the fighter and said, I've got some bad news for you, son. You'll be involved in a fight to the death, but you don't have to worry about killing your opponent. With your attitude, you'll clearly be the loser. I'm not fighting no one to the death, Hulk Hobo insisted. Jody nodded and stepped out of the ring. To the death, she called loudly. The audience picked up her chant and called, To the death. Raging Bill stepped close to Hulk Hobo, who was waving his arms in a gesture that indicated he didn't want to participate. Because his hands were completely hidden by the white bandages, his gestures looked clumsy and inarticulate. He looked like a runway controller, trying to express a complex argument as he backed away. I'm not fighting you to death, he told Bill. Are they really going to kill each other? Cheryl whispered. One of them will kill the other, Deacon promised. They don't have a choice, he explained. This fight has been planned for the past week and the players don't get a say as to whether or not they're willing participants. All they can do is fight to the death. He nodded into the illuminated ring and said, look at the way their hands are bandaged. Do you notice anything odd about it? Cheryl squinted at the pair for a moment and then gasped with horror. The stiff white bandages were tight and so thick they looked cartoonish but they were bound by metallic wires and, as Cheryl studied them, her eyes opened wide. Is that barbed wire? she asked. Deacon nodded. Exactly. Lengths of barbed wire had been looped and twisted around each fighter's bound fists and up their bound forearms. Both fighters were going into the arena wearing barbed wire boxing gauntlets. Why are they wearing barbed wire? Cheryl asked. Does your single brain cell ever get lonely? He wondered. He kept the thought to himself. In cockfighting, Deacon explained, they get the cocks to kill one another by fixing razors to their feet. This means even if the cocks are reluctant to fight to the death, like Hulk Hobo here, they're sufficiently armed to do a shitload of damage. He nodded at the barbed wire bindings and cutthroat razors on the bound hands of the tramps and said, this is the same principle. 
They're really going to fight each other to the death, Cheryl said. There was a breathless excitement in her voice that showed she was unable to disguise her enthusiasm. I didn't think such things happened in this country. Are they really fighting to the death? Yes, said Deacon. No, Hulk Hobo said firmly. He responded as though he'd been listening to Cheryl's whispered concerns. I'm not fighting to the death, he insisted. He took a step away from Raging Bill as the opponent pressed closer. I didn't sign up for a death match and I'm not participating. Then it's going to make it easier for me, Raging Bill announced, swigging a haymaker at Hulk Hobo and catching the side of his face. The barbs on Bill's glove gouged a series of bloody lines on his opponent's face and ripped through the tangle of straggly beard that hung from his chin. Hulk Hobo roared with discomfort and staggered backwards. You fucking idiot, he exclaimed. Don't you see you're playing into their hands? If we don't fight each other, what are these pussies going to do? If we both refuse, they'll be burying two corpses tonight, Bill grunted. Before he had finished saying the words, Raging Bill used his right fist to attempt an uppercut. Hulk Hobo blocked the assault with a defensive sideswipe. It meant his left forearm was abraded by a rush of minor lacerations, but he protected his face from the wicked glint of the razor and the brutal thrust of the barbed wire. Maddeningly, the sideswipe left Hulk Hobo defenceless against an unexpected jab from Raging Bill's southpaw. The blow was hard against the side of Hulk Hobo's head, and the added impact of the barbs on Bill's knuckles made him scream. A flap of skin was torn from his mouth, and a phlegmy string of blood spilled from Hulk Hobo's face. Will you stop doing that? Hulk Hobo demanded. He sounded furious. Didn't you hear what I said, you fucking idiot? Fighting each other is just playing into their hands. Are you too stupid to realise that? Raging Bill slammed across into Hulk's left kidney. I might be stupid, he admitted, but I'm not the one bringing pacifism to a death match. Two more punches and it was all but finished. Raging Bull aimed a lead hook at the right side of Hulk Hobo's face. It was a powerhouse blow that would have left him concussed if it had connected. Hulk stepped back, dodging the force of the punch, but he didn't step back far enough. The bracelets of barbed wire that covered Bill's bandaged forearms brushed past Hulk's face and tore through his nose. Hulk screamed, a sound that spluttered wetly through a combination of tears and rushing blood and unexpected pain. Bill took advantage of the situation and slammed a forceful jab into Hulk Hobo's throat. The contender went down on his knees, choking for air and waving a futile hand to indicate submission. Finish him, Jody called. Raging Bill drove a vicious kick into Hulk Hobo's chest. Isn't kicking against the rules? Cheryl asked Deacon. This is an unlicensed hobo death match, Deacon reminded her. They're wearing barbed wire gloves with razor blade accoutrements, and it's one continuous round until the loser has stopped breathing. I don't think any of them will be worrying about rules such as kicking. Finish him, Jody insisted. Hulk Hobo lay sprawled with his back on the wet sand, his battered and bloody face looking red as he strove to get air into his lungs. Raging Bill settled himself over the man and began to rain punches down on him with blow after blow of uncompromising force. Hulk moaned with the first three punches, but after those he remained peculiarly silent. After a minute of pummeling his opponent, Raging Bill stood up, held his gloved and bound hands in the air and shook with victorious jubilation. A crackle of something rang through the night, Raging Bill roared and fell to the floor, and Deacon saw a pair of sizzling cables protruding from the triumphant fighter's back. What the fuck? Cheryl exclaimed, squeezing tight at Deacon's bicep. Taser, Deacon said coolly. Jody knows she can't trust her reigning champion to simply go back to his cage and wait for the next match. It's easier to tase him, take the bindings off his hands, and then put him back in the cage until she's organised the next match. As they watched, two of Jody's assistants, an enormous black man and a muscly young woman wearing combat gear, walked toward Raging Bill and used wire snips to remove the barbed wire gloves from his hands. Behind them, Jody was taking money from the Preston guys in beanie hats, whilst two of her other assistants were dragging Hulk Hobo toward a transit van 
parked atop the sand. A tall figure approached Deacon and thrust a wadge of money into his hands. Your winnings, he explained. Jodie says she'll see you at the next event in a week's time. That was incredible, Cheryl told Deacon. The excitement in her voice was so rich it was almost palpable. I've never seen anything so exciting. Can I come with you to the next fight? Can we make this a regular thing for you and me? Deacon considered this and found himself coming to a swift decision. Cheryl was okay in the looks department and she gave a good knee trembler, but she was proving to be a damn sight more clingy than he needed. It wasn't that he had another girlfriend waiting in the wings or that he believed he could attract someone better. He just didn't want to form a relationship with someone as shallow as Cheryl. You enjoyed that? Deacon asked, forcing his features into a pleasant grin. He placed a hand on the tall figure's arm, making him wait with them for a moment. Just wait until you see what Jody has lined up for Friday night entertainment, Deacon told Cheryl. What is it? she asked eagerly. He placed a finger over his lips, as though indicating it was a secret, and then turned to the tall figure. Is Jodie still running slapper fights? When the tall figure nodded, Deacon snaked her arm around Cheryl's waist. She tried to pull away from him, clearly understanding what he had planned for her. But it was already too late. So thank you. Those are the opening two chapters from Seagulls from Hell. That's some of the ideas for the inspiration behind it. If you want to read any more of this award-winning novella, in that case, there should be a link below where you can find a copy. Thank you again for your time and carry on enjoying Blackpool.